Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, so as I said yesterday, uh, I would like to do a sort of uh, miniature wrap-up of some books I read in October. Um, but it turned out to be a very productive reading month. Um, and uh, talking about all of them would be kind of overwhelming. So I'm just going to talk about four that I uh, want to talk about in particular. Um, and yeah, two of them are, aren't even books that were on my TBR. But uh, just uh, for the record, I actually... I uh, knocked my TBR out of the park. I think there was only one book on it that I didn't end up uh, reading or finishing. Um, and that was uh, John Ashbery's Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror. Um, and I, I didn't end up continuing with it beyond the title poem. Um, but that's fine. So I'll talk first about the two books that were on my TBR and then two more books that I uh, read sort of on a whim. Um, and so the first book I'm going to talk about is a book that I do not have with me because I returned it to the library. It's uh, The Solace of Open Spaces by Gretel Ehrlich. This was published back in 1978, and it's a collection of essays about uh, Gretel Ehrlich's time living in Wyoming. Um, and basically, um, she just discusses uh, you know, the landscape, the climate, the weather, um, the way of life of the people she lives among. Um, she lives uh, with ranchers for many years. I don't know if she still does or um, if that was just one period of her life. Um, but uh, Grisha Ehrlich is primarily a nature writer, although she also has published some novels and some poetry collections. Um, but you can really tell that she has a flair for talking about nature, because she really invoked the landscape of Wyoming, and not just the landscape, but the actual feeling of being there. Because, you know, the title, po the title essay, so The Solace of Open Spaces, talks about being in Wyoming and being in this vast open space where all of a sudden you can see, you know, a hundred miles in any direction. And, um, so it's more than just talking about what the landscape looks like, it's also about how that makes you feel. And I thought she invoked it brilliantly, and she writes in such um, beautiful prose. Um, I highly recommend this book if you're interested in uh, in the West at all, or in Wyoming. Um, it's it's a quick read, it's like 130 pages, and um, it's beautifully written, and, um, and yeah, I just, I highly recommend it. Next is a book that I've mentioned a few times, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, A New History of a Lost World by Steve Broussat. Um, so Steve Broussat is a paleontologist at the University of Edinburgh um, in Scotland, but he's originally from the United States. Uh, he actually worked with Paul Sereno at the University of Chicago during his undergraduate years. And uh, Paul Sereno, I know that name because he was all over the dinosaur documentaries that I watched as a kid, so um, it was kind of nostalgic to hear about Paul Sereno a little bit in this in this book. Um, but uh, Steve Broussat, uh, he sounds like a bit of a prodigy. He's only 34 or 35 and he's already discovered um, 17 new species of dinosaurs. Um, but anyway, uh, this book is just a very straightforward um, history of the time uh, that dinosaurs ruled the earth. Um, it starts um, right around the time of the uh, Permian extinction, which took place, which is a massive extinction, actually the largest extin extinction in history. Um, it took place just before the rise of the dinosaurs and helped, in a sense, to pave the way for the rise of the dinosaurs. And um, then he goes through how dinosaurs became the dominant species of animals, because uh, just after the Permian extinction, it, they were far from the dominant species, uh, group of animals um, in the world at that point. In fact, um, they were actually sort of fringe animals who were very small and uh, sort of at the mercy of a lot of other groups of animals, um, especially this group of animals called the Pseudosuchians, who were these... Um, massive lizard-like creatures that walked on four legs and had these really bulky bodies and were actually uh, closely related to crocodiles, interestingly. Um, and um, and it, it wasn't inevitable, the rise of the dinosaurs, um, because of that state of affairs. Um, and it's still a bit of a mystery why the dinosaurs ended up taking over from um, these other groups of animals. Um, but this, anyway, he goes from there forward, he talks about how dinosaurs got so big. There's a really interesting section where he talks about how sauropods, the long-necked dinosaurs, supported their gigantic necks and bodies. And um, actually, interestingly, one of the things that helps sauropods to maintain their gigantic bodies is the fact that their lungs are very similar to birds' lungs. Because um, birds' uh, lungs are different from mammal lungs. Um, they're more efficient and help to get more uh, oxygen out to the bones. Um, which helped the sauropods to support their gigantic bodies. Um, 
and he goes through other re other ways in which the sauropods were allowed were able to get so huge. Um, he goes through the evolution of birds, of course. Uh, you can't have a book about dinosaurs without talking about birds, um, because they basically are dinosaurs. Um, he has an entire chapter about how Tyrannosaurus Rex evolved, and also an entire chapter about Tyrannosaurus Rex himself. Uh, he has a whole chapter, uh, of course, at the end about the extinction of the dinosaurs as well. Um, and yeah, he really uh, takes a huge subject and uh, just makes it into a very digestible, very well-written uh, narrative. I think this book was delightful. Uh, I think it would be good for anyone who is a seasoned dinosaur enthusiast or is um, a newbie. Um, the one thing that I might have uh, been left wanting at the end is was a bit more details about how dinosaurs lived, um, you know, the everyday lives of different species of dinosaurs. Um, he doesn't really talk about that very much, um, except in the uh, in the chapter about Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, if he'd done that, then it might have killed the narrative uh, flair of this book. Um, because if he'd been stopping uh, frequently to talk about different species, ways of life, this book may have gotten sort of boring. Um, so I think I can see in the end why he couldn't do that, but um, I might have I might have liked at least a little bit more of it. But um, but anyway, I do highly recommend this. It's very well written. It's very good. It's also um, the history of the dinosaurs is also interspersed with anecdotes from Steve Broussard's own life as a paleontologist and his own sort of history as a paleontologist, which which I also really liked. So it's it also has little bits and pieces of sort of memoir like writing, and um, it's just a it's just a delightful little book. I I highly recommend it. The next book is a collection of poetry, um, The Light on the Tent Wall by Mary Tallmountain. Um, this was published back in 1990, and uh, Mary Tallmountain is uh, a poet of Athabascan descent, who are an Indian nation living in Alaska, and um, she has had quite uh, a life. Um, so she was born among the Athabascan people in Alaska. Um, to a mother who was As who was Athabascan and a father who was white, um, her mother died of tuberculosis when she was very young, and her father didn't want to keep her, so he put her up for adoption. And her adopted family um, took her away from her homeland, um, forced her not to speak her native language. Uh, her father, her adopted father, molested her. Um, her adopted mother committed suicide, and then she herself had a long struggle with alcoholism uh, until writing sort of helped to start uh, save her and bring her out of that. And um, and then she became one of the major writers of the Native American Renaissance, which was this uh, flowering of Native American literature and art in the second half of the 20th century. And um, <clears throat> so these poems um, are very simple and straightforward. Um, there's no big pyrotechnics in them. They're very simple and easy to read. None of them is beyond one or two pages. Um, they explore nature and the destruction of nature and uh, the destruction of identity and identity itself, her identity as an Athabascan woman, but just identity in general. Um, family and how uh, past generations affect the current generations. Um, and um, I have mixed feelings about this book because um, about I would say perhaps a quarter or to a third of the poems were some of the most moving poems I've ever read. Um, I, I've i never been brought to tears by a poem, uh, but this the poems in here that I liked came the closest, because um, there's just an emotional directness to them that is so uh, touching. Um, and I would like to uh, read one of those poems to you. It's very short. It's called uh, There is No Word for Goodbye. And uh, you'll have to excuse uh, my pronunciation. There are a couple of Athabascan words in here that I am not sure how to pronounce, so uh, please excuse pronunciation. So, there is no word for goodbye. Sequoia, I said, looking through the net of wrinkles into wise black pools of her eyes. What do you say in Athabascan when you leave each other? What is the word for goodbye? A shade of feeling rippled the wind-tanned skin. Ah, nothing, she said, watching the river flash. She looked at me close. We just say, tla. That means, see you. We never leave each other. When does your mouth say goodbye to your heart? She touched me light as a bluebell. 
You forget when you leave us. You're so small then. We don't use that word. We always think you're coming back. But if you don't, we'll see you someplace else. You understand. There is no word for goodbye. So yeah, that's just an example uh, of her poetry, uh, how very direct and simple it is. And um, poems like that will stick with me for a very long time. But the rest of the poems in here, unfortunately, the other three quarters to two thirds were uh, forgettable, I think. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I have mixed feelings about this. Uh, but in the end, I'm, I'm going to keep it because of poems like that. Yeah, light on the tent wall. Last one is uh, a bit of a doozy. Um, it's um, The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, which I read in uh, this edition of the Basic Works of Aristotle, um, which is a huge book with uh, most of Aristotle's most important works. Um, but yeah, this was a, an, impo an impromptu buddy read with Elena Macridina and Crystal from Biblio Atlas. Um, basically what happened is last Sunday, um, last Sunday evening, I just pulled this off my shelf and uh, started to read the Nicomachean Ethics um, just on a whim and I suddenly felt very motivated to finish it because before I knew it I had gotten like 20 pages in. Um, so I sent Elena a Voxer message asking if she would like to buddy read it with me because we had been we had been um, scheduled to buddy read this next year at some point. Um, so I didn't want to leave her out of the loop if I was going to read it. Um, and she said yes, because she's a trooper, and, um, yeah, so we've been reading it this week, and uh, I finished it on Thursday, and, um, yeah, uh, Nike Making Ethics is one of the most important works of ethical philosophy, um, and I've been, it's been on my bucket list for a long time because of that, I'm very interested in philosophy, um, and, um, basically, uh, Aristotle talks in it about what he sees as a happy human life, or as a fulfilling human life. Um, and basically his answer boils down to what is human's essence, um, and what constitutes something's essence is what, uh, it can do that nothing else can do. And what humans can do that nothing else can do is use our reason, basically. And, um, so basically the path to a human, to a happy human life for Aristotle is to use our reason. And there are two sort of, um, two sort of... Uh, ways of doing this. There is uh, the way of the virtuous life, which is where you use what he calls practical wisdom to um, live virtuously, essentially, to make the right moral decisions, to um, live uprightly, and to live basically by a golden mean. Um, Aristotle has these ten, um, ten virtues and ten vices, um, and you're supposed to live sort of um, at the center of them, you know, like for example with courage, you're supposed to be um, not too brave so as to be rash and not cowardly, but uh, just brave when it's appropriate and uh, but maintain um, some level of self-preservation. So these ten virtues and living according to them um, and making the right decisions in many different situations is the virtuous life. And then the second path to happiness is the contemplative life, where you basically um, use what he calls your theoretical or philosophical or scientific reason to d basically just spend your life finding the truth. Um, and he argues that that actually ultimately is the highest form of human life because it's essentially to him the life of a god. Because gods don't have physical forms, um, they don't, they don't need to be virtuous because they're not, because virtue has to do with interacting with other physical beings, but gods don't have physical beings so they don't need to be virtuous so they just spend their lives contemplating. Um, so Aristotle sees the contemplative life as the highest form of human happiness. And um, so yeah, and he explores a lot of other things aside from those in this book. Um, you know, he talks about friendship and how important it is to being happy and self-love and how important that is to uh, being a friend to someone. Um, he talks about pleasure. He talks about a little bit about politics. Actually, the end of the Nike Making Ethics acts as a transition to Aristotle's politics. Um, which is another one of his books that I think I might read at some point. Um, and, and many other things. I can't go into everything in the Nicomachean Ethics because it is jam-packed with ideas that have become kind of ubiquitous in our world. Um, I think, I, I hope that what I've talked about in terms of the ideas in here has made it clear that a lot of these ideas are pretty simple. Um, and have just come into sort of our common consciousness in the Western world. Um, 
And so that kind of leads me to my main frustration with the neck making ethics, which is the fact that these ideas are not complicated or difficult to understand, and yet the way Aristotle writes about them makes them seem that way, um, because he it writes so poorly. Um, you know, he says in a paragraph what he could say in a sentence, and sometimes what an idea that perhaps needs a paragraph he says in only a sentence. Um, and so the writing is just very uh, convoluted and um, not necessarily difficult. I think everything is pretty clear, but um, it could be clearer, especially considering how simple the ideas are. And um, so that was hugely frustrating. Um, I really just wanted this to be this well-written treatise, and it wasn't. It was it was boring and uh, kind of dry. Hard to read for that reason. Um, not hard to read in terms of understanding what he's saying, but just hard to read because it's just so dry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. But um, I think probably part of that is because the works that we have of Aristotle aren't, uh, aren't really what he wrote. Uh, at least according to a lecture I listened to about, about the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, the lecturer uh, said that um, the works we have by Aristotle are uh, lecture notes that his students transcribed. Um, so Aristotle himself may have been an excellent writer, um, we don't know, but uh, his students may not have been. Um, so yeah, um, while I liked the ideas and I find them interesting, I, it was an immensely frustrating reading experience. Um, Anyway, that wraps up uh, my favorite reads of October, so uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know if you've read these and if you have any thoughts on them. I would really love to hear. Um, and yeah, I will uh, see you next month, so bye guys.